Hi guys, welcome to our first video in a while. We're going to be talking about iron deficiency. I'm going to go through 10 top tips specifically designed for higher trainees and GPs. We're going to dive right into it. So tip number one, do not wait until your patient is anemic. So we know that iron deficiency without anemia can still cause symptoms like fatigue, weakness, poor concentration. So even with a normal full blood count, it's worth testing for if your patient's tired and you don't know why. Treatment can improve their symptoms and the iron deficiency, even without the anemia, can suggest something else is going on. The other reason to do this is that this can support other comorbidities. So patients with chronic renal failure or congestive heart failure can benefit from being iron replete, even if they aren't anemic. Number two. The full blood count in iron deficient patients can show a thrombocytosis. So we're all used to seeing a full blood count with a microcytic anemia. That's the hallmark of iron deficiency. But often these patients will also have a high platelet count. Now, those with chronic kidney disease are unlikely to have this. Those with chronic inflammatory disease, your classic anemia or chronic disease, might have a slightly high platelet count, but usually in iron deficiency, it's even higher. Number three, so not all iron deficiency anemia is going to be microcytic. So just because someone has a normocytic or macrocytic picture, do not rule out iron deficiency. They might just have mild iron deficiency. More likely is they'll have it mixed with something else, a B12 or folate deficiency, or very commonly alcoholic liver disease with that chronic bleeding. And the microcytic and the macrocytic cells, they average out in the counters and give us a normal value any other conditions as well causing larger cells. Tip number four, always ask why. Why is my patient iron deficient? It's not enough to diagnose and treat it. You have to look for the underlying cause. Is it dietary? Is not enough going in? Is there a need to support um, growth? So teenagers or pregnant women? Is there inflammation or something else causing malabsorption? So is the patient just not eating or have they got active malabsorption? So that's a, an endoscopy picture of Crohn's. Another reason that patients may not absorb the iron is if they're having antacids at the same time. Or, and this is probably the most, um, most relevant, is bleeding, because these are the ones we really don't want to miss, the colorectal cancers. And iron deficiency anemia in your older patient is an alarm symptom and a reason to go for an endoscopy. Tip number five, don't rely on your ferritin. So ferritin is good. It's old, it's cheap and it works. It's very sensitive. So if the ferritin is low, they are iron deficient. Job done. But if it's not low, that doesn't mean that they aren't iron deficient. So it's not a specific test. Okay, and I'm hoping you remember that ferritin is an acute phase protein. So in iron overload states or any inflammation, the ferritin will be high. And that's when I think we choose uh, the further tests. Point number six is to don't, don't get bamboozled by the other tests. I think people have memories of medical school with large tables of different types of transferrin and arrows pointing up and down. It's not that difficult. Your serum iron in iron, iron deficiency will be low, but this is variable throughout the day. The serum iron is also low in anemia of chronic disease. Total iron binding capacity, i.e. how much iron the cells are able to bind, this will be high in iron deficiency. The cells are desperate for iron, but in anemia of chronic disease, that will be low. These two readings are used to calculate the transferrin saturations. In iron deficiency anemia, we often see readings of less than 10%. If you're very suspicious and they're less than 20%, you could always trial some oral iron. And this is the calculation. So it's your serum iron over your TIBC times 100, and that's how we get that calculation. Point number seven, consider using reticulocyte hemoglobin or CHR. So this is a fairly new test. It's very popular because it's sensitive and specific, except in one group of patients with that, which are the thalassemia patients. So if you've got readings that don't quite match up, your patients with the right background, or they're just very, very microcytic compared to 
their hemoglobin level, then it's worth considering if they have a thalassemia gene. Otherwise, though, for most people, CHR is a great test. Number eight. So how do we get our patients to actually take their tablets? This is one of the biggest challenges in iron therapy. So I'd always warn them about the side effects before you start the treatment. So tell them about the gastric problems that they may get. So it's not a surprise. Rather than starting TDS dosing, I tend to start low and then build up. So once or twice daily and then build up if they can tolerate it. And that way you're including the patient in the decision making process. So I often just do once daily dosing. If that gives side effects, you can even try alternate day dosing. Point number nine, this is about increasing absorption. So make every tablet count if they are giving side effects. So take on an empty stomach and take with orange juice or ascorbic acid, and that will increase the amount that they absorb. Do not take with tea or coffee. So the tannins will inhibit iron absorption, make it a total waste of time. Don't take with the other meds, especially um, antacids as well. So patients often take them with other medications. That's It's not the worst thing in the world, but ideally it should be alone. But especially with PPIs and other antacids, try and avoid that because it will affect the absorption. And finally, number 10, when to use intravenous iron. So I use this in two main situations. That's when I need quick results. So in late stage pregnancy is, is the classic. 34 weeks pregnant, found to be iron deficient, you need to get results in a hurry, not enough time for tablets, and IV iron's a quick, safe and effective way to do that. Or if the patient simply cannot tolerate their tablets. So even with alternate daily dosing, nothing's happening, or they've got surgery in a few weeks and you don't think it's gonna happen in time, then you can use iron uh, intravenously. And you can see the bag on, on the picture, it's this black gloopy stuff, but it is safe. There's the old fashioned stuff about anaphylaxis that's very uncommon. It's said to be about one in 250,000. The patients still need to be consented for that, but it's a lot safer than people think. And finally, a bonus tip. What puts people off IV iron is the dosing. The recent European inflammatory bowel disease guidelines recommended this simplified way of estimating iron need. Um, it's reasonably accurate compared to um, to other calculations but if you are worried just look at the product literature right we're going to finish there uh, thank you very much for listening